This is Paul Gerard. Um, thank you for coming to the webinar. Um, very uh, interested in the topic of today myself and really want to share some research I've been doing over the last few months uh, into big data and the potential it has in general but also specifically uh, in the world, the wonderful world of testing. Um, today this first uh, webinar is, is primarily about um, what it is and why all the fuss. You know, what, you know, why, why are people getting excited about it or rather uh, why are other people getting excited about it? Perhaps I should too, but why? Okay. So to summarize, you know, what I want to talk about in the next sort of 40 minutes or so uh, is really about what big data actually is. Um, what do we mean by the term big data? When people mention big data, you know, what are they banging on about? Um, there's a lot of hype out there, of course, and it's been my kind of, um, kind of uh, task, if you like, or chore to try and filter out all the hype from what the real essence of what the damn thing is all about. So really what I want to do is to give you a, like a shortcut view on what big data is to save you having to read all the stuff I've read. I've probably gone through approaching a thousand pages of text now to try and understand what the hell is going on out there. So I really want to talk about uh, big data and what all the fuss is about. Uh, big data is really has no meaning until it's analyzed and used for the purpose of making some decisions. So uh, the, the, the process of decision making is now coming into question and how we can make use of technology plus data to support decision making at mostly a senior level. But I think increasingly these facilities will be filtering down to um, all people who have access to technology in effect. Uh, I want to give an overview of the big data market and by that I mean the people who uh, are promoting the concept of big data and uh, you know, offering tools. Um, so the big data market is about really who is collecting data, who is managing that data and who is making use of it and perhaps selling, selling it too or selling the outcome or decision making or analyses of that big data too. Um, I'll spend a, a short time looking at tools. I mean, technology space is moving incredibly rapidly in this area. Um, so I'm really going to give a really superficial view of what I think is going on out there. And then I want to talk about uh, some challenges and opportunities. So I'm not going to talk so much about testing today, but rather put a foundation in place because I want to talk about uh, testing in big data environments in future webinars. So this is kind of the first of a series. So let me suggest that. Okay, so that's enough of the intro. Let's just get into it. Now the first thing I should say is a lot of the content I'm going to show and some of the pictures have been lifted from uh, quite a few sources and you can see them here. Um, I should also say that a recording of the webinar will go on the website uh, and I'm hopeful that you'll be able to sort of pause the video and see uh, the sources I've used. And there are many, many more sources I could have used. This is what I happen to have uh, found useful in the last uh, two or three months. Um, I'm not uh, giving any credit to any of the uh, images in, in this uh, session. Um, I really should do, but I didn't want to clutter up all the pictures with the references because there are so many of them. So um, I give all these sources uh, big credit for some of the content uh, I'm using. I'm happy to, if you ask me a question about a particular image, I can tell you where it comes from. But my suggestion would be to have a flick. All these, all these, all this content apart from the, uh, the Savalage and Martin Fowler book is available on, on the net. So if you do the search for the content, you'll, you will find it and you can download it for yourself. Okay, so wherever you seem to turn, uh, the words big data uh, are kind of trending. Um, not in a Twitter sense, although I suspect that will be there somewhere, but more in the sense that the, the biggest IT corporations are now promoting big data in a very big way. Um, they seem to think that talking about big data directly to chief executives um, is uh, the policy of the moment and they're clearly trying to sell services and products, consulting and tools to support this concept of using data that is being collected and maybe not actually being used at all because of its sheer volume or because of its sheer diversity um, the big corporations are promoting it that, that you have an asset which perhaps you can make incredible use of. But it's only recently that the technology has existed to do this uh, economically. 
So it looks like something big is on the horizon, uh, although I think uh, some organizations in, are now using big data and some of the obvious uh, candidates, we can talk about those later, but I think in your, in your organization, big data is on its way. It might be a year or two away, or it might be right on your doorstep, uh, but I think it's coming. It is definitely on its way. Now, some people, and maybe to most people, um, it still looks like a lot of hype, and I think uh, that's quite true. There's an awful lot of stuff out there which is kind of uh, marketing fluff. But what I want to suggest is that if you think a bit more deeply about what's being said and the impact and the possibilities of, that big data provides, that it has a potential to affect every person in society. And it's not something that you can avoid. Um, it's not about, uh, okay, well, I'm just going to dis disconnect myself from the internet. Um, almost every device that has a power supply that you come into contact with will be capturing data about you or your movements or your habits. Um, it's kind of interesting, but also a little bit scary. Let's get, let's, uh, get down to it. So the first thing is, um, in my humble opinion, uh, big data isn't really about big. Big isn't the most important thing. It is big, it's huge, but there, there, are, there are other aspects to this. And uh, this, this idea of the, the four Vs, V4, call it what you like, um, describe the dimensions of what we're talking about here. So the first one is the obvious one of volume, this just sheer volume of data. Um, it's kind of obvious now that almost every interaction you have with other organizations, um, with uh, the modes of public transport, with the uh, broadcasting, with the internet, obviously, um, any device that has a power supply and that runs software probably keeps a log of transactions. So any interaction you have with that device um, potentially could be a source of data and it could be a source of data not stored on the device but somewhere on the internet in the cloud. Now the companies like you know Google, Amazon, eBay and so on and so forth I mean quite obviously have been living and breathing big data almost since they are their earliest days. The sheer quantity of uh, access accesses to their web-based services gives them a mountain of data that potentially they have been mining to look at how they evolve their services. Now that's fine, but all organizations that have a, a, a web presence, for example, are finding it easier to collect and store data. Now it's not just about, well, just keeping logs and stuff like that, but it's some organizations, they live and breathe data. Um, so an example might help here. And this, this is a kind of an obvious one to think about, although it's not so obvious if you don't work in manufacturing. In a manufacturing plant, every device that, has, that is powered probably is numerically controlled. It, it is driven by software. It captures data. That data can be stored and logged and analyzed. And if you look at this example of a, um, a healthcare product, uh, you can see that this, uh, and this is a real example, I think from the uh, IBM kind of paper, the the sheer quantity of data that is being collected, you know, four trillion samples of data per year, you know, 152,000 samples per second, whichever end of that spectrum you look at, it's a huge quantity of data. Now, in the past, it's not been uh, realistic to analyze that kind of data, but the technologies are now emerging and are becoming industrial strength, you know, it's sort of um, a very high quality and reliability. Technologies are emerging to allow one to manage and manipulate and to analyze and to mine information out of that data. So we have the, the, the scale, the sheer scale of data, of course, but also it's the rate of arrival of the data. So the second V is velocity, you know, data in motion, if you like. Um, uh, the example that's you know, often used is like Facebook captures 2.7 billion likes per day. It's probably by the time, uh, this time next year, it might be double that, who knows. But the sheer quantity of rate of data that, as, it, as it arrives is just huge. Now, even if you have a, a mid-sized company with a popular website, you might be logging 100,000 or a million hits per day. Now, that's not a vast amount of data, but those logs are probably sat there not being used for anything other than looking at the growth of uh, uh, accesses 
accesses hits to your website. Potentially, there's all sorts of information buried in logs, such as the, the words that people are searching you know, in Google, and when they arrive at your site, that, that search pattern is recognized and stored on your website. So knowing why people have found and clicked on your website is buried in these logs. Now, data is, is moving at, at very high velocity, um, and it might be kind of real time or street, whatever. But but there are some um, sort of mantras which I'll I'll put in quotes over the course of the next sort of half hour or so. And one kind of uh, mantra is this idea of real time data only has value if used for real time insight. So the analyses of data at such volume arriving at such velocity need to be analysed in near real time within 24 hours because it has a shelf life. So the so the rate of arrival of data is a factor in how you adopt technology and the analyses you use to infer the, the you know if, if to infer to derive to to gain insight into what's happening out there. So we need to know what's happening right now and the, and the, the, the sheer rate of arrival of data drives some of our needs for technology. But we also need look, to look at the history and use predictive analytics, as it's called, to look at data arriving today to drive the behavior of our software directly for its customers, the, the customers who are arriving, browsing, buying right now. Now, the, the two other Vs, um, the first one is variety. And, and this is kind of the scary one in that the data we, we hold in our transaction-based systems, in our relational databases, every item of data sits within the context of a data dictionary. Every item of data is a column in the context of a row which has a definition of its meaning. So structured data comes already tagged. It's easily sorted, manipulated, and so on. But the vast majority of today's data that's being captured is unstructured. So it's held in typically flat files. It might be uh, plain text, it might be binary, it might be encrypted, but it's, it's not stored in the structure of a database. So in some respects it's kind of random, it's certainly diffi more difficult to analyze, and the quantity of it is huge. Now the other aspect of this is there are new types of data. So video, music, hardware instrumentation loads, call center notes, blogs, social text, just written text. It's all data that, it's, that, it is, uh, that has content that potentially has value. Now, of course, we can't use all of it, and a lot of it cannot easily be integrated to give us a view across all these sources. So part of the skill has to be, the skill of a data analysis has to be, how do we select from this variety and variability of data what has value? And the fourth fee really is uh, veracity. And you could look at this as the accuracy, truth, or value of, of that data. So there, there might be sources of data which we track and store and then use for analysis. But much of that data is based on an input from a human being who, uh, by and large, are not like robots who are perfectly precise, who make, they have feelings and sensitivities and prejudices and so on. So a lot of the data we capture is about the behavior of people who are not necessarily the most reliable people. Now the other thing aspect is there may be uh, uh, metrics and data captured by instrumentation out there, but it, the source itself might be inaccurate. So um, measurements of, of uh, rainfall and temperature and wind speed and are all accurate locally but we don't have a measurement for every square meter of the planet. These measurements are taken at very large intervals and then there are huge uh, interpolations and speculations based on this data. So we have to take a view on the truthfulness of the, of the source data before we can rely on the outcome of an analysis. And a trivial example that uh, I, came, I came across recently was uh, Hurricane Sandy, you know, the, tr the tragic kind of uh, hurricane that hit uh, the U.S. Uh, east coast. 
Now, interestingly, uh, if you looked at an analysis of where all the tweets were coming from during the, that period when the hurricane hit and just after, most of the tweets came from Manhattan, which was largely unaffected by the hurricane. But if you look at the tweets and, and, and treated the, the, the density of tweeting with you know, the, um, the eye of the storm, that's foolish because clearly as the storm hit, power lines fell and people's phones began to run out of power. So of course, the tweets did not come from the area where the storm hit. And, and that's a kind of a trivial example, a massive example, but a trivial example of where the data is misleading. And so this notion of veracity is something that we have to understand what we've got in our hands. We need to check both the source data as well as the analyses we do on it. So one of the uh, reports I looked at was this uh, IBM and Said Business School in Oxford. Um, kind of a survey of, of I think about 800 uh, large organizations. It's very typical of uh, the IBM way of how they operate. But, um, and the report is kind of interesting in some ways. Um, so I recommend you, you, you take a look. And one of the uh, t many tables and graphs they, 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 they published, one of them is where uh, big organizations are getting their big data. And right now, top of the list is transactions. So it is still the, let's say, traditional relational database, the transactions within their IT systems, which is providing uh, the big data. And 88% of companies say that's, they're using that as a source. And that's perfectly natural, of course. And then you start seeing, well, 73% of companies are using log data, so, so uh, typically um, uh, web access data or or logs of accesses of their systems. Um, another one is events. So organizations like a manufacturing company might be tracking the, the uh, alerts generated by the, the machinery right across their organization. Um, emails, interestingly. So 50% of companies are collecting emails and scanning the content of emails, which you may or may not know. And then as you go down the list, you see social media, sensors, external fees, and so on. Um, Freeform text, 41% are using freeform text. Now, who knows what those sources are, but the text of the language that people are using is being used to uh, derive analyses themselves. So the content of the emails or the, or the documents that you have within your organization are being used to look for patterns and trends and so on. Um, audio and images are quite low on the list, but actually a third of companies are using audio and image data and video data, which again is kind of interesting. Now what tools are these people using? So this is the same survey. Um, the, t the top of the list are query and reporting. So of course, you know, the standard you know, SQL oriented tools with relational databases, absolutely top of the list. And organizations that have data mining uh, products, you know, data warehouses and uh, more sophisticated scanning and, research and, and search features in um, uh, data warehouse products. They're pretty high at the moment. But also you see things which are becoming uh, not necessarily dominant, but are always going to be up there. Data visualization. I, I see data visualization, excuse the pun, data visualization will increasingly become important because the types of analyses are not simply going to be bar charts and scatter graphs and lines and so on. I'll sh and I, I'll, I'll point you at a, at a resource at the end of the, the, end of the talk to give you some examples of uh, how the visualization of data is changing really rapidly because the tools are moving on. And you see things like predictive model modeling and optimization and you know, linear analysis and all kind of other clever mathematical stuff. Stuff that was the preserve of universities is now coming out of universities and being used by larger organizations on their big data. Now, other, other tools that you see down there, natural language tests, 50% of companies are using tools to analyze natural language. And geospatial, again, that's an increasing, you know, where, where was the data captured? Where was the individual when this item, this transaction occurred? This, where this individual interacted with our organization? Where did that physically happen? So geospatial, uh, aspects are increasingly uh, being used. 
So okay, so that's kind of a quick overview of big data, but you know, what's the first? You know, why care? Why do we care of this? Uh, I'm not going to read this out, and uh, I'll kind of leave this on the video for, for, for after, but it, the, 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 the arguments being put to CEOs is that if you ignore your big data, you are going to lose um, time on your competitors. The data you have is providing your competitors uh, insights that maybe you don't have. It's as simple as that. The value of big data business is to uh, is potentially it will allow you to optimize your performance to make better decision making. So how how does data drive innovation, competitiveness, and growth? Um, I mean, when uh, you have a CEO, you know, flying business class on a plane and picking up the magazine and sees big data being discussed uh, within the pages of the magazine. Uh, the CEOs arrive you know, the following morning and basically say, I don't know what it is, but I want it. If companies like you know, uh, Amazon and eBay and Oracle and IBM are, are telling me this is the future, I have to respond to this. I don't know what it is, but I want it. You could say analytics is the new buzzword in that analytics now is any source of data can be analyzed and analytics is a, is a word that's uh, uh, I think only recently existed as a, as a noun. But analytics is a new discipline which will find its place inside the head offices of most organizations. Now the, the the benefit of the outcome of this analytics on potentially real-time data and huge quantities of historic data is, is this idea of continuous improvement, continuous gathering of data uh, in flight to allow you to, the, with analysis, to allow you to uh, improve the quality of your products, you know, the, the efficiency of your processes, the reliability of process and plant and you know, the speed of supply chains and so on and so forth. Um, data is driving innovation, competitiveness, growth. This is being force-fed to CEOs right now. Now, it's not just uh, corporations, large companies. It's also big government. Um, a few months ago, um, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, you know, Barack Obama sort of um, unveiled a big data initiative. You know, two hundred million dollars or pounds, I think it was, in dollars uh, in in new R and D investments. Well, this was a year and a bit ago, I guess now, and there were five kind of core agencies within the, within the government, all of whom had uh, many projects being funded by this two hundred million dollars uh, or pounds, whatever. I want to suggest that it's kind of a drop in the ocean. I took a look at the one of the seventy or so initiatives uh, that were mentioned in this announcement, and. Here's one example, and it was uh, kind of, it, it didn't stand out, and yet it's remarkable in, uh, if you look at the content of it. The Proceed research effort seeks to overcome a major challenge for information security, blah, blah, blah. They're looking to create programming languages for computation on data that remains encrypted in its entire lifetime. So the, the principle they're trying to promote here is to say, rather than... Um, do your processing on data, encrypt it, and then dispatch it to some target, and then it is then decrypted, processed, re-encrypted, and so on. Why not just work within the confines of completely encrypted data at all times? Now that would be quite a quite an achievement because what I take from that is it, it's almost the case that given any encrypted data, it will be possible to use a programming language to process it. What a tool that would be for hackers. Now, it may be that it can be uh, constrained within the, uh, you know, within the confines of, of, a, of a government department or research department, but how likely is that? So, so if you look at that as a, as, a, as, a, uh, as a project, I'd say it would be worth investing $200 million just in that one project. The actual investment in uh, big data my guess is in the billions. Maybe it's 10 billion. It's much bigger than this idea of 200 million. That's just a political kind of goodie that's being offered to the press. The real research effort going on out there is, is in the billions. It has to be. So, okay, so the hype is there, and I've 
probably want to bombard you a little bit more and talk about big data and decision making. And this is kind of just to give you a sense of what's being said at senior levels about how data can be used. So the first thing is like um, if you collect data and it's constant and uh, unchanging, well, that's kind of rather boring. There's nothing to be learned. It's where data changes over time that it becomes interesting. So it's in order to detect a change, you have to store it over time. You need to have uh, time-based, time-serial data in order to detect trends, which implies, firstly, that you have to collect the data, and secondly, you have to collect it potentially for all time in the future. So all data that is captured, without knowing its value yet, and it may have a value in the future, all transaction data, all logging data, all instrumentation data is now being collected just in case it has a value in the future. There's a notion of uh, this concept of from business intelligence to predictive analytics. Again, this is kind of hype and a little bit buzzwordy, but the, the principle is that business, whereas business intelligence gave you kind of raw data, although that was never quite the truth, Predictive analytics will give you much greater insight into the rate of change of data. So rather than looking at static data for patterns, you're actually looking at dynamic data changing over time and looking at trends over time. And there's this kind of uh, concept of from data to insight. So what is being sold is much more insightful analysis of data that you really didn't know had value in the past. There's a kind of process to follow in this uh, in this uh, value chain, where we have this uh, concept of acquisition, marshalling, analysis, and action. I don't want to dwell on this, but you can see there's a process being sold here, and you can imagine that actually there are some products which are going to fill these gaps or maybe provide an end-to-end -end solution. This is what is emerging, and there's a there's a, a concept being sold to people to decision makers that actually at the moment they're making rather uninformed bad decisions and what you could be doing is making more insightful and more accurate and more reliable decisions in the future. So there's a whole new discipline called decision management and decision analysis which is emerging out of uh, the opportunities that big data presents. So um, this is the uh, uh, kind of thinking that's going on there and where you have this these concept of decision discovery to discover that there is a decision to be made perhaps because the data is giving signaling some kind of uh, future activity there must be uh, software products to support decision services and there's decision analysis to 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 to, to close this loop between operations and decisions actually to connect the decision made today with the impact on your business operations tomorrow and having made a decision today, we collect the data tomorrow, and tomorrow evening we'll make a decision on whether to, to uh, sustain the changed operational kind of environment. So the whole idea is, is moving decision making from um, str strategy to day to day, faster turnaround. You could call it decision agility. So here's an example of a of uh, FICO's uh, decision management platform. It's a whole range of software products primarily uh, based on uh, cloud sources of data um, and then you have this integration and uh, marshalling kind of process as a second layer and then all these uh, decision oriented services which allow uh, that data to drive decision making almost like a machine. Um, God knows how much time all this kind of stuff takes to set up and operate reliably, but uh, companies are promoting their concept of having decision making as, a, as another process to be automated. So okay, who's who in the big data market? Again, this is a source from a, a couple of blogs primarily, and whether they're reliable, who can say, but they kind of give an interesting perspective. So one way of looking at the big data market is th these three aspects of big data production, management, and consumption. And you can see uh, the huge 
uh, internet companies are obviously involved in all three of these areas. So the operating system and browser, software developer, search engine, social networks, all these big corporations that they all now are uh, cover all three of the aspects of the market. But you can see that the telecoms operators are big collectors of data, maybe uh, manage it, but they are not yet big consumers and they are not uh, making money out of that so much. Um, you can see data scientists don't produce data, they don't manage it, but data scientists, uh, maybe that's a new term, a new, a, new, a new job, it's not clear to me yet, but data scientists are consumers of data, they don't produce it. Another way of looking at it is to see what the roles of the various uh, aspects of the uh, of industry, what they each have and what products they are now promoting. So you can see the internet players, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft are, produce, uh, 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 are positioning themselves through their cloud-based services to be massive collectors of data and analyzers of data using, um, using the cloud, using uh, primarily uh, free software, open source software. Uh, the hardware vendors are obviously uh, building software products and uh, they are acquiring companies to uh, support a range of products and services which they will be basing on big data. So they won't be collecting data so much as, as supporting the analysis and use of it. And then you have the software software providers themselves. So SAP, as an example, are building in big data capabilities to SAP. Um, Oracle of offering big data appliances. Clearly, they're in the database space, and relational databases are out, and NoSQL databases are in. They own Java, and who knows what else. So uh, you can see the software providers are positioning themselves to basically sell product, I think. No change there. Um, IBM weren't mentioned on this blog, uh, but uh, they're in there big time, surely, uh, I, I have to say, because uh, certainly some of the papers I've, writ I've read have been written by IBM, but, but also IBM have been collecting data on mainframes for so many years, you know, before any of us were uh, at, at all familiar with the, the, the technologies of today. Uh, so IBM are in there in, big, in a big way, probably in all three spaces. So let's look at the technology very briefly. I don't want to spend much time on this, but I cannot because it's moving so quickly. But also, the, the impact it's having on the technology space is really significant. If, if volume and velocity are driving the technical aspects, relational is out, and not only SQL, no SQL uh, products are in. The sheer scale of data and its rate of arrival um, is overwhelming relational databases in the traditional sense. So new database types are emerging, and um, uh, the Martin Fowler reference and Saparaja book um, talk about key value, document, column family, and graph as, as four different types of database, uh, databases that are emerging. Um, I can't really sort of talk about that in any length, maybe uh, in a future webinar, but the technologies themselves are moving very quickly. Now, that's those mostly are for data storage, but how, how do we get real-time analyses on massive, massive quantities of data? Well, an open source project called Hadoop, which uh, is, was uh, kicked off originally by Google and who uh, certainly, certainly use it themselves. Um, Hadoop basically provides a capability to do massively distributed processing of data. Um, it's much more than that, but essentially, what would take a top, top of the range uh, processor and system to process in a day might be processed in sub-seconds by a highly distributed Hadoop-based service. One of the beauties of Hadoop is that it's intended to be run on relatively low-cost hardware product. So, you may have seen the video of uh, the, you know, the tour of uh, one of the Google data centers. They, they create custom-built servers, which are relatively cheap hardware devices, but on a massive scale and distribute work across uh, that massive range of, of cheaper devices. So overall, the cost is not as high as it sounds. Um, MapReduce is a... Um, not necessarily a, a Hadoop term. It's more a, it's a, it's a generic term for 
distributing processing in an efficient way. And the MapReduce process is really something that can be daisy chained, sequenced. So the output from one MapReduce process can be fed as input to the next MapReduce process. So uh, analyses of data which would take hundreds of years traditionally can be done in seconds using this MapReduce concept. And one also has to say is that MapReduce is fault tolerant. So one of the ideas with data being distributed on these NoSQL databases is um, there is built-in redundancy. So um, it might take 10,000 servers to generate a result, but half the data might be um, uh, stored on many of those servers. Now what's also emerging uh, very rapidly, I have to say, is a whole series of products that are based on Hadoop. And to pick one almost at random, I think Pig sounds interesting. Um, Pig, I, I don't know more than I've, I've got the text in front of me, but it seems like to be a platform for analyzing large data sets that consist of high-level language for expressing data, blah, blah, and so on. You can see this is a shorthand for an analysis program that gets its data from somewhere else. It sits on top of Hadoop. And so what you're seeing is that, that Hadoop will distribute, will take an inquiry and process it very rapidly. And the, the tools that sit on top provide more and more sophisticated analyses and, and searches. So a bit like you know, Google search. How does a Google search deliver a response in a fraction of a second? Because it's based upon a Hadoop supported platform. So, OK, so the tools, that's a very, very quick overview. Of, of the, the tool situation. But watch this space. There are huge numbers of significant products being developed and delivered in the open source arena, but obviously also by uh, the big, uh, you know, the giant companies offering uh, big data uh, systems. So let me talk about challenges and opportunity. So the first one is really, uh, there's a, a an article from the Harvest Business Review, which is uh, much referenced nowadays, um, and basically titled, Good Data Won't Guarantee Good Decisions. Although we have the technology, and although we're acquiring the data, and although we are um, acquiring um, very sophisticated analyses, it seems that businesses have not yet got their head around how they take an uh, analysis and make their decisions. So it's very early days in business terms for using technologies and people who are with a mathematical orientation, you know, physicists, engineers, people who are used to using massive amounts of data for analysis. Um, it hasn't yet been embedded in businesses in a way and settled down so that people can make good decisions. Here are some of the kind of uh, buzzwords from that paper, which are interesting, I think, because this is, this is the argument to CEOs to say, you need to pay attention to this. Uh, so the analytical skills are con concentrating too few employees. It's mostly consultants who are providing these analysis kind of services. It's not yet embedded and brought into the knowledge base of, a, of an organization. IT need to spend more time on the I and less on the T. Well, it was always so, wasn't it? But clearly, at the moment, it's all technology-driven rather than the information-driven and the decision-making, the decision requirement-driven. Reliable information exists, but it's hard to locate. Of course, in a corporation, there must be mountains of data distributed in the corporation, but finding it or even knowing it's being captured in the first place might be the first challenge of a corporation. And also, business executives, you know, don't manage information as well as they manage talent, capital, and brand. I mean, simply this, that it's never been big on the agenda before. Now it is. Suddenly, there's a big demand for uh, data and analytics-orientated management. Now, the other uh, recent headlines, you know, and I just chose The Guardian because they tend to focus on this kind of uh, privacy aspect. Um, these are some of the recent Guardian headlines, you know, how Microsoft handed the NSA access to encrypted message, messages. Uh, you know, if, so the big corporations are powerless to resist the need of government to pry into the data that's being captured by other corporations. Now, ostensibly, this is to 
support you know, homeland security and uh, you know, anti-terrorism measures. But even so, you know, did you know this was happening? And it, it appears that, that it was rather embarrassing, given the, the Snowden kind of uh, affair that's, that's ongoing. Um, it's really rather embarrassing. And it was interesting, there's a, uh, there's a very interesting response from the UK government, from William Hague, saying, we don't do this. <laughs> now, I don't know whether to believe that or not, but it's interesting that governments are finding it essential to actually say they are kind of responsible with the data that's being collected. Because, because the sales pitch is oriented towards instant decision making supported by highly reliable big data, there's a notion now of saying, well, wait a minute, if our, if our business is driven through software, then the changes to the software, our changes in, our, changes in uh, our business are actually changes in software. It's the software that is the um, mechanism by which business change is happening. So if I want to make a, if I trial a decision today and I check it tomorrow, organizations are moving very rapidly into what we understand in the software world as continuous delivery. So there's continuous delivery of software into production, monitoring of that changed software, and then the day after, retaining it, changing it, abandoning those changes. changes. So we're moving very rapidly into this continuous delivery process. So this is going to affect testers, of course, obviously developers. Obviously, the agile kind of disciplines are coming to the fore. Now, we've argued for... Uh, about three years now, this idea of redistributing testing, you know, as was the death of testing, actually it's being redistributed, in order to support rapid delivery with accurate requirements. You've got to recognize that if you have continuous delivery, you must have continuously good requirements, otherwise you get the garbage in, garbage out kind of syndrome happening. So we argue very strongly that we use uh, text and language of our requirements to formulate you, you you test coverage measures to validate requirements themselves and to drive test automation because there is not time to do it any other way. So what I want to suggest is if, if the software world is moving to continuous delivery and we have to have very high quality requirements, we have to example those requirements and we use those examples to generate test automation at a feature level, I should say, then all this process is going to collect a lot of data. Now, companies are beginning to recognize the value of collecting and analyzing data in production, but the use of a feature in production is not so far, far removed from the testing of a feature in development. So test analytics is a proposal I have whereby we use the automation of testing and the automation of uh, monitoring, software monitoring in production we use that to give us a, a full end-to-end -end picture of what is going on in our software in its execution, if you like. So our argument is, watch this space for new ways of looking at the development process and the production process. It's all big data. So we would argue that if, we, if our requirements flow from business goals and risk, and the data we collect in testing and in production can be aligned with those business goals and risks, then the instrumentation in production and in our testing should align with our business processes. So the principle must now be that when a goal is set at a, at a board level, our testing and our production monitoring should align with the decision making associated with those big decisions, if you like, with those big goals. So expect to see new graphical ways of presenting uh, the outcome and the evidence of test. So this is the argument we're using now to support this idea of test analytics. Testing is not so much about finding bugs. Of course, it's about finding bugs, but it's, that's not its primary goal. It's about measuring achievement in some respect. So the, so the testing we do in development and the production monitoring that happens in the real world in, in live systems is source data for measuring achievement against business goals and risk. So 
So if that's the case, then test execution management is going to change dramatically. Of course, we'll have manual testing. It'll be embedded within the development space, but that's not the source of data that we'll use for ongoing monitoring and measurement. So if, it's, if we regard the software process as um, uh, ag agile and continuous, we'll probably move away from cycles and phases of testing because the majority of the testing will be automated and a minority will be done manually simply because there isn't time to do it any other way. Now that might sort of uh, terrify some folk because it means that actually we have to rely on our automation to allow us to make very fast release decisions. Well, so be it. The principle being that we must drive our test automation by business goals and risks and rely on that automation to give us the data on goals and achievement and risks and risk mitigation, we must rely on that data. So it's a new mindset, which I think is on the way. So two things are, come from that. One is, if we have this on, ongoing continuous monitoring of our software development and our software production processes, it opens doors to allow us to continuously improve our businesses through software but also allows us to do much more interesting um, business impact analysis. So several things spin from that, but one of them, one of the most important will be we need new ways to look at how testing and production monitoring, we need new ways to, to visualize the data that is captured in those processes. And I'm not convinced that the way we do test execution management today with the traditional tools will get as any 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 anywhere near what we need. Um, in a live uh, demo I would have uh, shown you uh, this website and a webinar it's a bit tricky but um, I want to uh, sing the highest praises for uh, a, 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 an open source JavaScript library called D3. D3 data driven documents. Uh, there are some fantastic examples in the gallery there. Now it's not the only product out there and it's not the open, only open source product but just the sheer diversity of visualizations that that library produces makes me really excited that there's lots of uh, new opportunities to look at our, the data we have in testing in a new way. So uh, do check that out. Look for search for D3, I'm sure you'll find it. Okay, to close. Uh, big data isn't going away. It's on the horizon, maybe for you, but it's coming your way. It might be on your doorstep right now. I'd like to argue that it's not just a large company phenomenon. It's not just for the corporate uh, uh, guys. It's the facilities that are becoming available will operate on huge quantities of data. But those facilities will also operate on smaller quantities of data. Maybe it's not big data, but the facilities are, are really exciting about what's uh, just around the corner. Now, one of the things that we have to be careful about is there's a, definitely a social challenge associated with much of uh, the data that's being collected out there. And, and it's, it's kind of uh, down to us to regulate our own uh, businesses, um, and in, our, our own business and government to ensure they don't abuse uh, what they're collecting. Um, it's going to be a difficult one, I'm sure. Now, big data analysis and software development coexist in this idea of insight action loop. So I didn't talk about this decision making process, but I think big data is going and the facilities and the features that big data is going to provide us with will change the way we think about software development and testing because the testing is our monitoring process for development. Production monitoring is giving us big data too. I expect testing to be absorbed into some form of test or production or data analytics business oriented as well in the software business. The more the businesses rely, come to rely on software, the more important it will be that testing contributes to the data used to manage those processes. So continuous delivery might not be happening in your organization yet, but I think you will see pressure from CEOs to move in that direction. So test analytics, I want to suggest, is big test data management. Okay, so um, I've probably overrun. Uh, I've got a couple of minutes for questions, so let me just check and see what's available, and I'll try and respond. Uh, how are we doing? 
okay, uh, just a couple, I'm afraid, but that's okay. Um, not got much time anyway. Um, so one person is saying, I won't name, <laughs> I won't name them, um, I think it's still hype. In my opinion, uh, it's still hype, you know, so maybe it's further away from you, whatever. Uh, you know, what evidence is there to say this is actually this is actually happening? Well, I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine who works um, with a um, scientific computing uh, health healthcare oriented uh, software business, and they have hired this year so far seven data analytics professionals, mostly from the mathematics, physics, and science kind of uh, backgrounds and they've got budget to hire another seven. So within a few months, there'll be 15 people in this team. Uh, that company have decided they are very much into big data, and it seems to be a bit of a trend that the companies are hiring uh, data scientists, uh, for want of a better job title, um, on the hope, on the aspiration, that the data these guys will analyze will generate some gold. Now, there's a bit of a, a risk there. Maybe it's a me too kind of thing that companies are just saying, well, they're doing it, so I'm doing it. But uh, if very smart people are hired to do a job that is kind of wide open, there'll be, there will be some product, there will be some outcomes from this which will have value. Um, I'm pretty certain that um, it's a good time to be a mathematician or a scientist with um, data analysis uh, in your kind of bloodstream or your DNA in that uh, I think these people are going to be very attractive to certainly the larger companies initially, but I suspect all companies. I think there's a real role for data analysis in, in the um, organizational hierarchy because all departments collect data. Um, now there is a, a discipline and a responsibility to do something useful with it. Uh, another question on uh, tools, inevitably. Um, what tools exist for data analysis. So um, not all data is big data and requires uh, Hadoop, um, but the other area of research I'm doing at the moment is I'm looking at open source tools. Um, I happen to be a Python programmer, so the books on my shelf that are um, all fresh from Amazon uh, are to do with, uh, let me find the titles of them. One of them is Interactive Data Visualization. Uh, that's uh, using uh, D3 to visualize data. I've got a book by a guy called Nathan Yao, Yao, or Yao called Visualize This, the, Plo the Flo Flowing Data Guide to Data Visualization and Statistics. Um, whatever, I'm literally just trying to dig, dig these books out off my desk. Um, Python for data analysis. So Python is a scripting language, but the data analysis products, the free data analysis products that are out there, um, are, tend to be written in C, so they are very fast. So although Python is a script language, the libraries that fit within that um, are free. Um, I've got another book called Data Analysis with Open Source Tools. So again, this is looking at things like uh, matplotlib for, for, for visualization. Uh, what are the tools I mentioned? Again, it's slightly uh, Python oriented. But again, these four books are just sort of four out of probably 400 that are out there which describe how you can do very sophisticated data analysis with open source products. Now the uh, proprietary, you know, the, the tool vendors will be trying to sell you proprietary products, but you know, the mathematics of this has been in universities for years and years, and the libraries to do data visualization have also been around for years and years. They're emerging out of the open source community and now becoming, dare I say it, mainstream. Uh, all the references to the content that I've shown on screen um, are in the video, but they're, they're on like slide three, so I hope you could uh, take a look at some of those references and uh, get some value out of that. Okay, with that, I'll say thank you very much for attending, and I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.